All right. So, I'm going to call, call this sermon is called The Greatness in You. Now, I'm not giving you this sermon to puff you up and to give, make you prideful. I want you to look at the person next to you right now. Don't just glance at them. Look at them. That means you don't look at me. <laughs> look at the person next to you. Amen? And look at them and know this. That person has incredible value and greatness in them. Not because of what they do or what they don't do. Because of what God put in you. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that God created man in his image and his likeness. So I want you to know something. That you are created in God's image and in God's likeness. That to me blows my mind. Because everything that he does, I can do. Except that you know what, you know what I mean by that. Everything he has, he gives to us. And he gives us his greatness. He gives us his goodness. He gives us his salvation. He gives us his healing. He gives us everything that we are and what we can be. Amen? So, during the week, when God gives me a message, I start to look at people a little bit differently. I'll start to look at people, and God will say, that person is suffering from low self-esteem. That person is doing this. That person is suffering from that. That person is suffering from that. And I'll say, Lord, we're all suffering from something. We're all broken. So, how many uh, see that show on TV called New Amsterdam? I watched that show. That's about a doctor um, who's kind of like a socialist person. Everybody gets, you know, gets, uh, you know, um, medication, everything for free, hospital visits, all that other stuff. If they can't pay for it. It's not a big deal. That's not why I watch it. I watch it because there's some spiritual content there. This past week, they had a doctor on there. Um, who had a problem with drugs. And she had to go to a psychologist because her boss said to her, either you go or you're going to be fired. So she went. But the whole thing was, the reason why she was suffering from what she was suffering from was because of how she grew up. And when the psychiatrist was going through this with her, he was uncovering certain things that the reason why she always felt like she had to be the best, why she had to be taking care of everybody, was because her mother was an alcoholic. She was a 12-year-old, had to take care of her mom. The father was a workaholic because he didn't want to be home to deal with the mother. So a 12-year-old had to take care of an alcoholic mom. And all this guilt and all this shame and all this other stuff came upon her. That's kind of like us, church. See, we're all a mess. <laughs> Nobody can say that they're perfect. And that puts us on a level playing field. Because God doesn't recognize your faults. God doesn't recognize your sin. God doesn't recognize any negative thing that you do. God recognizes who he created you specifically to be. Can I get an amen on that? See, people will look at you and say, Oh, he's an alcoholic. Oh, she's a drug addict. Oh, he's, he's a homosexual. She's a lesbian. She's this. He's that. And we point out the sin and the faults. But God says, Gideon, now keep in mind, Gideon was in a barn hiding, thrashing wheat because the Midianites were around them stealing everything that they owned because of their sin and God let them do that. So Gideon was hiding, thrashing the wheat so we have some food to eat and the angel of the Lord pops into him and says, Gideon, mighty man of valor, Gideon was hiding. <laughs> Did you get that? He was hiding not to be seen so he could get some food for his family. He didn't want to confront the enemy. He was hiding. And God says, mighty man of valor, champion. He's calling you for what he created you for. He's calling greatness out of you. So many people say, I don't have this. I don't have the money. I don't have the education. I don't have the looks. I don't. You have the most important thing that you need. You have Jesus Christ. He's the power that radiates inside of you. More than you can even ask, think, or expect. Does that make sense? You, church, are a masterpiece. <laughs> you are not the sum of your mistakes. Well, I, I, say, I talk to people, why don't you go to church? Well, you know, Pastor, I'm just not good enough. Neither am I. But I'm here every week. I'm a sinner just like you. We're all sinners. Thank God we're all sinners. Because this is a hospital that we can come to and Dr. Jesus says, I'll take you just how you are. 
You are a masterpiece. You are a work in progress. Can I get an amen on that? You don't have to look at yourself in the mirror and go, ugh. You can say, praise God, I'm not there yet. But God, you're working on me. And I can be happy because you're working on me. So it just so happens that I had this tucked away in my car. And I want to read something to you. There's six points. Nothing about you is an accident. I love that. I was born too short. I'm too tall. Nah, that's us. We control that. Sorry, can't blame God on that one. That's us. Amen. I wish I could blame that on somebody, but no, I can't do that. Too tall, too short. My feet are too big. My hands are too big. My nose is too big. Hey, get gots. It doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> you are not an accident. Everything about you is per Everything, your personality, your gifts, they're purposely given to you to use them for God's glory. For God can draw that greatness out of you because you can affect other people's lives by the gifts that you have. We have a couple coaches here. We have Nurse and, and Andre. I don't know about you, I couldn't coach a team. Because if I tell you something two and three times, you know, listen, I'm taking you out with a two by four. I don't have patience for that. I told you, don't do it that way. And I would go nuts. I would lose my Christian testimony. But these guys have the patience. And God gave them that. That's their greatness in them. To draw out the greatness in their players. That's a gift. So everything you have is not by accident. If you're going to reach your highest potential, you have to see yourself as unique. You are one of a kind, church. Well, I'm just like so-and-so. No, you're not. No, you're not. You can be similar, but you're not like somebody. Because if you were to take your fingerprints, you couldn't find two people with the same fingerprints in all the world. Think about that for a second. How many people have come and gone? How many people are alive today? And science says there's not one that has the same fingerprint as you. God must care pretty much about you and how he created you to make you unique. And we would have people tell you that you're worthless. You're not worth anything. You come from the wrong side of the tracks. What does that mean? What does that mean? I come from the wrong side of the tracks. It doesn't matter what side of the track you come from, you come from the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you become born again, you become a child of the Most High God. It doesn't matter where on the tracks you reside. What matters is what happens in here. Amen? So you are a unique, church. The opinion you have of yourself is more important than anyone else's opinion of you. Come on. Aren't we always concerned about what other people think? Well, if I do this, then that. And if I do this, then that. And if I do this, then that. But you look in the mirror, and you don't see a masterpiece. You look in the mirror, and you see a loser. Not so. Church, not so. When God looks at you, he sees a child. He sees his creation. He sees you as a masterpiece. You are a work in progress. And you have to see yourself that way, church, because if you don't, you will always walk around thinking that you're less than somebody else. You are not less than someone else, ever. I don't care what your financial status is. I don't care what your educational status is. I don't care if you were in prison for 30 years and got out. I don't care. You need to value yourself and not worry about what other people say about you. You need to care what God says about you. And let me tell you something. God has a whole lot to say about you in this word. How you are more than a conqueror. How you are an overcomer. How he loves you. You are called beloved in this word. That's more, church, than just loved. Beloved means a dying love. And Jesus died for you. You are God's beloved. But pastor, so-and-so was in prison. So-and-so was a rapist. So-and-so did this. So-and-so did that. So, that's what they did, church. It's not who they are. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. See, church, we're all broken. Can we all shake our heads yes to that? We're all broken in some way, some capacity. But God says, I'll take that brokenness if you give it to me. And I'll mold it into something great. But if you don't see who you are... If you see yourself the way the world wants you to see yourself, low, 
loser, this, that, and the other thing, and the way the enemy wants to see you, then yeah, you'll always be down there. But God says, I created your soul like an eagle. This word has so much to say about you. Why don't you read it? And internalize that. And renew your mind. You may have had a mother that was an alcoholic. You may have had a father that beat you. You have may not had the greatest upbringing in the world. But guess what? God can use that to make you a better person. To make you the person he created you to be. You still have greatness in you. Some people are constantly stomping on it. But you can come from underneath that and be who God created you to be. Come on. What do they say to Jesus? Isn't that the carpenter's son? Like being a carpenter was such a bad thing. Yeah. Think about it. Look what they did to Jesus. Here the guy was. He did marry. Isn't that the carpenter's son? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't he live in Knightsville? <laughs> Didn't he come from South Providence? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what they said. That's right. One of the, one of the future disciples said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah, something great came out of there. And there's more great people in there. You came, you, you live in South Providence? Oh, you live in Chicago? You live where? You live in Harlem? What, what? Harlem? What good can you be? And that's what people get conditioned to believe. But God says, ah, I have greatness in you. I don't care where you were born. There's greatness in you. I don't care if your father was Hitler. I put greatness in you. And I'm going to call it forth. And that's why I respect teachers and coaches so much because they can see greatness in people. And they can pull it. And Jesus saw greatness in people. And he pulled it. He pulled it out of them. Amen? Just think, Jesus saw... I'm going, to, I'm going to continue with this because this is really good. But I want to stop for a second. The lady that was caught in adultery, right? We all know the story. I like that story. Men, of course, that had to be men, right? Righteous men, religious men, Pharisees, scribes, take this lady out of adultery. <laughs> the man doesn't get, you didn't even hear about him. He doesn't get nothing. They bring her and they throw her at the feet of Jesus. Now I'm sure on the way there they were belittling her. Calling her every name in the book. Because they're just like us, aren't they? Back in 2,000 years ago, same, same man, same, same self-spirit going on in there. So I can see them belittling her. And they bring her to Jesus and say, this woman this piece of trash, and so forth and so on, was caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses' law says she needs to be stoned. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus, number one. So, I, Jesus is such a cool dude, man, I'll tell you. Jesus swoops down and starts... Now, everybody says, well, what are you writing to say? And I don't know, I wasn't there. And obviously the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to know because he doesn't say it. But he's just playing around in the sand. I could just... <laughs> I, I, some pastors say probably write the names down of the guys that committed adultery. <laughs> so he stoops down and, and he says something so simple, but something so profound. He says, "Let him who is without sin cast the first stone." I'm not saying you don't do it, but you better be perfect to do it. And what happened? It says from the oldest to the youngest began to drop their stones and walk away. So now picture this woman who was absolutely embarrassed because keep in mind, you know how they today, how people are with their phones where if you have a fight or whatever you, they're, they're, they're videotaping you. Well, I can imagine back in the day they didn't have that but they were all nose bags around there too. Wonder what's going on. See what Jesus was going to do. See what the Pharisees were going to do. All looking around. So here she is, she's shamed in front of all these people. She was terrified that she was going to get stoned. And then Jesus says, woman, he's just so cool. He's, Where are your accusers now? Are they gone? Yes, Lord. Meaning, salvation came. That word Lord there means salvation hit her. Yes, Lord, they're gone. And he says, they don't condemn you. I won't condemn you. And I, this thing, he could have. 
and she knew he could have. And he chose not to. And he says, neither do I continue. Go, listen, go and pull out the greatness in you and sin no more. Now, did she sin? Yeah. I'm not sure if she sinned that sin anymore. But she's human. We sin. We, we know Jesus, right? And we still sin, right? Because that's in our nature. We're going on to perfection. Amen? But he says, go and sin no more. Meaning, don't, don't do this thing anymore. He's pulling the greatness out of her. The enemy wants to condition you. Sex trafficking is one of the biggest things that we're at this country, all well, the world, is facing right now. What they do is they take young girls, <clears throat> 12, 13, they kidnap them, and they force them to have sexual relations with older men. Continuously. Sometimes one after the other. What they're trying to do is break their spirit. Break that greatness in them. Break it, break it, break it, break it. To the time where they feel worthless and like trash and want to die. That's what the enemy does to us. He wants to break us down by the conditions that we lived in. People that we've come in contact with. He wants to break us down. But church, let me tell you something. You have greatness in you. Each and every one of you has a value to give to the world. You were not just put here by some random act. God knew that you were coming. How do I know that? Let's turn. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Is this helping somebody today? Yes. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 1. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, and Jeremiah is a prophet, by the way. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Think about that. Before your mom and dad even thought about getting together to create you, I knew you. <laughs> Does that not blow your mind? Before you were formed in your mother's belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. I put great, before you were born, I put greatness in you. Church, before you guys were ever born, God put greatness in you. Who is taking it away? Well, I don't feel. According to this word, you don't go by your feelings. You go by what you know. Renew your mind. <laughs> Do you know how long it took Thomas Edison to get the light bulb bright? Think about it. I think it's like 400 some odd times. I could be wrong. I did some ridiculous amount of times. But do you know what his mentality was? I didn't fail that many times. That's to say it was 500 times. He goes, I just learned 500 ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> now think about it. Now if you come from, from a family who doesn't encourage you, you loser, how many times are you going to try that? You fail 10 times, forget it. You don't know how to do it, forget it. No, there's greatness in you. You keep doing it until it manifests. You keep doing it until you get it right. You keep saying, yeah, he did. Thank God. Amen? Praise God. There are too many people. Church, listen to me. There are too many people walking around. <laughs> and I hop on this because I, I work with so many gay folks. And they're such, they're such awesome people. And I'll sit and I'll chat with them. And they'll you're a pastor? Yeah. Well, do you accept gay people in your church? And the first thing I look at them, I'm like, no. Joking around with them. I'm like, of course I do. Why would you make you say no? Of course. Well, we don't go to church. Because we're not accepted. Gee, your sexual orientation has what to do with God putting greatness in you? See, we all have something going on. Alcoholics, wife beaters, child abusers, you name it. We all got stuff going on. But God put greatness in you. See, the world will label you by what you do. God labels you for who you are. 
a child of the Most High God. And when we start to understand, you can't, you can't insult me anymore. You're fat. Yeah, so what? You're ugly. Okay, we're even. Do you know what I mean? I don't care what you want to label me as. Here comes the holy roller. I'm rolling around. That's why I'm fat, I can roll. <laughs> it doesn't matter! Because I know what God put in me! I know what God put... People used to tell me all the time, you are not... My mother was a great one for this. You are never going to get... I love her to death, I'm not... You will never get anywhere without a college education. Wrong! College education helps you, no question. But, work hard, trust God, and God will open doors for you. People used to call me, check this out. My neighbor used to call me a stuttering buffoon. Because I remember I told you I used to stutter. I couldn't get in front of people and talk. And look what I'm doing now. I'm speaking at a conference come June the 8th. Tell me what God can't do. Tell me God can't pull the greatness out of you. Came in contact with Andre. Andre came in contact with this person. And now they invited me to speak at a conference. That's something I've always wanted to do. But the stuttering buffoon couldn't even dream of that before because I was always put down. You trust what God says about you. Not what people say about you. By the way, Moses had a speech impediment too. Just saying. Just saying. People see you. Check this out. People see you the way you see yourself. Well now, how do you see yourself today, church? Do you see yourself victorious? Or do you self see yourself getting beat up? Do you see yourself constantly in a financial mess? Or do you see yourself financially free? Think about it. Do you see yourself healed? Or do you see yourself sick? Do you see yourself heavy? Or do you see yourself thin? Do you see yourself successful or unsuccessful? Rich or poor? Because the Bible says, as you see yourself, so will you be. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So as you see yourself, that's how people will treat you. I love it. When I come into a room and people are swearing, they go, oh, I'm sorry. It's like, you're not offending me. Because I hold a different type of authority. I don't go in and throw the F word around. Not all the time. I do it sometimes. I can be honest with you. I'm human. I try to... That's part of my deficiency with my... That's my father's side of the family. <laughs> but God's working on me with that. But i got to be truthful. I'm not going to lie to you. Amen? People see the way you see yourself. Okay. Yep, wrong one. Okay. God has already approved you. Don't you love people pleasers? We suffer from that sometimes, don't we? Well, what if so-and-so doesn't like me? So what? But so and so doesn't like me. Yeah. So I don't like him either. So what? Who cares who likes you? Who cares who approves of you? <laughs> the enemy. When I first became a pastor. I, I, <laughs> that little tree company service that we used to be. I remember. He used to take the pulpit, and I used to go into pre-prayer all the time, and the enemy would say, man, did God pick the wrong guy for this job? You shouldn't be up there at all. And I would be tormented by that. Be tormented by that. And so I said, whoa, oh, who are you talking to? I'm a child of the most God. Until I realized who I was and the value that I held in Christ Jesus, that didn't change. Until you see who you are. You're approved of God. Nobody needs to approve of you. Nobody. I don't care if the President of the United States. Nobody needs to approve of you except him. And if you get his approval, you get everything you need. You're the, yes. And if we start to tell each other that, and we start to meditate on that, on all the good things that God says who we are, we're going to live free. Amen? And the last point he has is, our value doesn't come from what we look like or what we do, or what we know, or what we have, our value comes from the fact that Almighty God is our Creator. Before you were born, before you were even in your mother's womb, 
I knew you. Blows my mind. I think it's Psalms 139 that says, you knit me together. Think about that. Think about when you try to crochet a sweater for a baby or a blanket or whatever the case is, how all those integral knots create this beautiful design and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you create this beautiful fabric, this beautiful blanket, sweater, so whatever the case is. That's what God did with you. You guys are all knit together. Your personality, your characteristics, your talents. Some of you are funny. Some of you have very sarcastic. Do you know what I mean? But that's all God put in you. That's good stuff that God put there. Because God makes us all different. Can you imagine if we were all the same? Oh, God, it would be boring, wouldn't it? If we could be all the same, we should all be good looking. That's what I'm thinking. Thin, good looking, nice, healthy, and that would be perfect. But that's not going to happen. So we need to all in church. Amen. But God has a plan for us. Amen? Amen. Now I'm going to close with this. Moses. <laughs> you know how great Moses was in the kingdom, right? How many know that Moses argued with God? <laughs> he goes and sees this bush. I say it all the time. If I would go home and look in the mirror and the mirror would turn to fire and God's voice would come out of the mirror, I'm paying attention. And I'm not going to argue with it. Right? That's what I'm thinking. After I pick myself up, I think I'd faint first. But Moses is talking to, well, the bush is talking to Moses. God speaking to Moses from the bush. And then as he's having, as, I just love this. As God is pulling the greatness, because keep in mind, Moses' mother gave him over to Egypt, down the Nile, to save his life because it was up to Pharaoh that they wanted the, the boys killed. So God saved him for a purpose. He grew up in Egypt to learn all the customs and everything else. Moses was known in Egypt. Amen? He killed somebody because they were beaten in Hebrew and he killed the Egyptians that killed the Hebrews so he had to be exiled. God did that. Not that God allowed Moses to kill somebody but God purposely had him exiled for 40 years. Again, time of testing. Testing. But in that 40 years a lot of thinking had to take place. So Moses was at Pharaoh's house. That's like you being at the White House. Pretty cool place to be at. You think your ego would be kind of exploding at that point in time? Think about it. So, then he says, after 40 years in the desert, he says, I'm going to send you back. God says, I'm not the, he, Moses, I'm not the right guy for this. And he argues with God. I'm not the right guy. I don't speak well. I don't do this. I don't do this. A hey, bush is speaking to you. <laughs> Hello? God is speaking to you and telling you what you're going to do because he's put this greatness in you and I'm debating with him that this is not going to happen. Think about it. Does that sound weird to you? But finally, he relents. And what does Moses do? Through the power of God, with the greatness that God put inside him. He comes to that realization, he does what God calls him to do, and millions of people were let out of Egypt and into the promised land. Because he took his greatness. God pulled that out. Church, I'm going to close with this. I know what it's like to be belittled. I know what it's like for people to doubt me. I know what it's like to be called names. I know what it's like to be tortured in high school. I know these things. But I also know now <laughs> that my God does not create junk. I don't care who I'm looking at in the world. They have value. You have value. No matter what side of the tracks that you're on, whatever that means, no matter what kind of financial condition you're in, what kind of physical condition you're in. There's a guy I was seeing on the internet. I forgot what his name was. It's not the one, he's not the Christian, he's another guy. Born with no arms and no legs. Phenomenal. And I watched him. He actually he was coming down the stairs. Uh, when that's what caught my eye, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like saying, What's he doing? And he said he had to fight all his life because of what people told him he could not do. Now think about it. You mean well. You, you, I, I, mom, dad, whatever means well. Don't, don't do it. You know. He walks down the stairs. He jumps up the stairs. He gets on the table. He brushes his teeth. I don't know how he does that. But he, he does it. 
yeah. But he would not let. He wanted to graduate. He wanted to graduate with his class. And they were making fun of him. And he said, I wanted to go anyway. He said, I could not let people stop me. He saw his value. He has greatness. It doesn't matter if you're handicapped, if you don't have the money, if you weren't born to the proper family, whatever. It doesn't matter. God doesn't make junk. And you are not junk. Any one of us. We have value and we have greatness in us. Not because of what we do, but because of what we allow Jesus to do through us. And the more that you yield your life to Jesus, the more greatness that he puts in and comes out. It's almost like a cycle. And you are never the same again. And that's when you see people who are drug addicts or alcoholics and they're ministers today. Look at the son of, the son of Sam. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Remember the shooter in the 70s that would walk around killing people in their cars on their porches? I think he killed five or six people. He went to prison. He said Satan told him to do it. Yeah, I would guess. But today he's a minister. Born again. Awesome ministry in, in the New York prison. He's not out of prison because the Bible says, God is not mine. Whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. But, can you imagine knowing people hate you? The families of people you killed hate you? You're a murderer? And he changes his whole life perception. They cut his throat ear to ear to stop him from preaching the gospel in prison. Didn't stop him. That's a changed life, church. That's, a, that's when you meet Jesus Christ. And yeah, we would have every right to say, you are a scumbag. But God says, no. You, are, you become born again, you are my child. I'm going to use you. I'm going to pull greatness out of you. You may not think you're great, but I'm going to pull greatness out of you. And today he's serving the Lord and bringing hundreds of prisoners to the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. Think about how powerful that is. Remember, you know Coors Beer? Cool. The original founder was murdered uh, years and years and years ago. And his son, is a Christian, went into the prison and gave the person that murdered his father, <laughs> it's amazing, a Bible. Think about that. That prisoner is now saved because he saw value. Yeah, I suffered loss. I suffered loss of a loved one. You killed my father. You can't take that away. However, I've got to rise above that. That's the greatness of Christ in you coming out and giving it to someone else and not holding any end. There's story after story after story after story of people who suffered rape, unimaginable trauma, and because they knew who they were and trusted Jesus enough to let Jesus bring that greatness out, they are now bringing that greatness out and bringing other people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and changing their life. Isn't that what this is all about? Seeing people stuck in the, mu in the muck and the mire and Jesus pulled us out and we have to pull other people out too. When you see somebody that needs... You see so many people begging and we know what they're doing, some of them, and you can't make judgments on whatever the case is. But did you ever see someone who just looks like they're lost? And yet we just walk past them because we don't want to get dirty. We don't want to, I don't want to, I don't talk to that guy, he's crazy. How do you know? What are you making that judgment for? Maybe they just need you to say hello to them. Maybe they just need someone to talk to, just to be nice to them. Buy them a cup of coffee. Does that cost anything? $2.25? If you go to McDonald's, it's a buck. If you go to Cumberland Farms, it's a dollar six, or dollar eight, or whatever. It's not expensive to bless somebody. It's not expensive to tell somebody, hey, Jesus loves you. I see the value in you. Is that so hard? But we, as a society, don't want to put ourselves out that way. Because I don't think we value ourselves that way. Who am I to tell that person how great they are when I don't even feel good about myself? But if you know who you are in Christ, nothing should stop you. Amen? Let's all stand. Yeah. A long time ago, the Lord gave me a call. It's just kind of you and me. Because a beautiful diamond in a crystal ring. It's not just you and me. Vibrant colors when it comes to but when I look at the 
Amen. Think about it. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. That's exactly where we need to be, church. Amen. There's so much that God wants to do. I think that was the whole thing about our praise and worship today. Just God saying, just I'm going to give you abundant life. Let's all stand. Dave, can you just play like a slow song for us before we leave? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for creating greatness in each and every one of us. Father, we can leave here knowing, Lord, that before we were even born, you deposited greatness into us. Father, you knit us together in our mother's womb. You put us together intricately. And Father, we may have flaws, we may have faults, we may have baggage, we may have junk. But Father, we can give that all to you over a process of time. We can become the new creature that you created us to be. Father, we can go back and be healed of all the hurts of the past. Everything, every negative thing people have said about us, every negative thing we've said about ourselves. And Father, we can go back and relearn what you say about us. That we are the apple of your eye. We are more than conquerors. We are beloved. The very hairs of our head are numbered, Lord. You know us that well. And that intimately. Father, we should be more concerned about what you think about us than what the world does. Father, help us, Lord, as we leave here today to begin to see the value and the greatness in ourselves first. Because until we do, we'll never see it in someone else. Father, help us to heal from the inside. And then help us, Lord, to give an encouraging word to other people who are suffering, because we're all broken, and we all need encouragement, and we all need help. Father, today I ask you to bless your people, cause them to be the head and not the tail, cause them to be above and not beneath. Father, give us traveling mercies as we leave here for those traveling. Father, special traveling mercies for them, going and coming. And Father, as always, let there be a divine opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who so desperately needs to hear it. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys.